The secret to what gamers want rests inside this jar of extra chunky pasta sauce. And the answer is... Flappy Bird, Goat Simulator, and you again. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Game Theory, the show that's practically Game of Thrones, similar both alphabetically and in the sheer number of gratuitous boobs we show per episode. Actually, I did the math. They average about 5 per episode. We're more like 1.7, so... Uh, yay us? Anyway, we've spent the last two episodes, well, there was one I squeezed in there about the aforementioned boobs, talking about what gamers don't want. They don't want monochromatic 3D action. They don't want a tablet controller. And contrary to what we all say they don't want innovation. But there's a slight hole in that theory. Well, lots of holes in that theory. Holes that go by the name of Minecraft, World of Warcraft, the Wii, and many more. Innovative games and systems that broke with the established mold and went on to sell tens of millions, completely changing the gaming industry. So innovation works sometimes. And when it does, holy cow, does it really work. Which begs the question, why does one Wii succeed and another one fail? How does the Virtual Boy flounder while the Oculus Rift is everyone excited? Uh, well, I guess we'll try again in 20 years. What is the secret sauce that separates what works from what doesn't? Well, the path to our answer begins with another type of sauce, tomato. Meet Howard Moskowitz. He's not a game designer, he's not a game developer, or even a tester. No, the name of his game is Food. Food Optimization. Food Optimization Revengeance. Return of the Green Tomatoes. Anyway, what's Food Optimizer mean? Well, how he uses data from taste tests to determine the perfect combination of flavors to make a food appeal to the most people. But he hit a snag when he was hired to find the perfect level of sweetness for Diet Pepsi. The numbers made no sense. They should have fallen into a bell curve, with some people liking it sweeter, some people liking it less sweet, but most people falling toward the middle. Except the numbers didn't go that way. The data was a mess. It wasn't until years later that the answer finally dawned on him. They been asking the wrong question. They were trying to find the one perfect Pepsi to appeal to everyone. Instead, they needed to look for the perfect Pepsis. There was no one formula to appeal to everyone, but instead multiple formulas to appeal to clusters of people. Vlasic hired him to perfect their pickle. He told them not to touch the regular version, but instead make a zesty option. Sales took off, thus solving Vlasic's pickle pickle. But Howie's biggest claim to fame was in pasta sauce, where he found that people broke down into three categories. The ones who like straight marinara, the ones who like it with some spice, and the ones who like it extra chunky. But at the time, every sauce was thin. No one was selling a chunky sauce. Why? Because when researchers asked focus groups, no one ever said that they wanted a chunky sauce. Think about it this way. Do you drink coffee? I'm more of a tea man myself, but whatever. If I asked you what type of coffee you liked, what would you say? Studies show that most of you would say something like a rich dark roast. Great, but if I then gave you a taste test, Howie's data shows that only 25% of you would actually choose the rich dark roast. Quite the contrary, most of you would like it milky, thin, and weak. Practically me in coffee form. But when asked, no one ever says that. In general, Howard Moskowitz's research proves that people don't know what they want until they have it. So cool story, bro, but what's any of this got to do with games? Well, it's true for both pickles and pixels. Think about it. Here's a conversation that would never happen in any focus group ever. You know what I want in my next gen gaming scene? An open world rendered in retro graphics where I dig. Uh, dig and what now, sir? That's it. I just punch trees and I dig. Dig for minerals. And are you looking for buried treasure? Or there's a princess in an underground cast? Nope, just digging. Great. I'll make note of that. Minecraft, motion controls, these things are the chunky pasta sauces of the gaming world. Things that people were craving, but didn't realize they were craving. And with that knowledge in mind, going back to episode 1 of this series, the reason why it's so important for Nintendo to keep pushing the envelope by producing Virtual Boy's 3DS's Wii's and Wii U's is that they're finding those chunky sauces. The things people want in gaming without knowing it. That's also why the indie scene is so crucial. So the answer to what gamers want is that 
we don't know? Nope. There's definitely an answer that explains everything we've talked about so far. Why the Virtual Boy flopped. Why the Wii U is underselling. Why COD games and non-innovative sequels oversell. And why it's so difficult to predict the next trend. Flappy Bird. Flappy Bird? Flappy Bird. Flappy Bird? Flappy Bird. Flappy Bird explains it all. There have been tons of articles written in the wake of Flappy Bird's success. Everyone wants to crack the code of how this game took flight. Yeah, that was a lame bird pun. So sue me. Uh, don't really sue me though, that was just a figure of speech. And while the articles have theorized everything from fake reviews to bot downloads, the real answer that no one's talking about is PewDiePie. Here's the Google Trends chart for the relative searchability of Flappy Bird. As the line goes up, that's when more and more people are searching or talking about that thing. Looking at the chart, you can clearly see things start to ramp up around here. January 27th. Let me circle that in my meaningless on-screen calendar. Now, let's take a stroll over to the Bastion of Brofist. His video, Flappy Bird Don't Play This Game, was uploaded... Uh... Huh? Uh... Huh? Uh-huh. <gasps> It's the same day! Seriously though, while this man is out there fisting the world, he's also setting trends. So give him some credit, industry writers. Do your research, it's not that hard. At 25 bajillion video views, give or take a few, it's no understatement to say that the Pewds is influential. And his role in Flappy Bird blowing up exemplifies the essence of what gamers want. We want to belong. We want to do things that our friends and people we look up to are also doing. PewDiePie fills that role for tens of millions of gamers. Don't believe me? There's actually a theory, not related to games, I don't know how such a thing exists, but whatever, called Diffusion of Innovations Theory, which explains how ideas and technology spread through culture. Basically, it says that there are five types of people, innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggards. About 2.5% of people are innovators. They're the first people to adopt a new thing. They tend to be very social, they're willing and able to take risks because they can handle any potential losses. To illustrate, let's use YouTube and PewDiePie as an example. He's the biggest channel on YouTube by far. His videos get millions upon millions of views. If he takes a risk on a video and it doesn't work, meh, it'll still do pretty well and he has enough other videos and views that he can sustain the loss. So PewDiePie does a video on Flappy Bird. People start to check it out. Seeing that PewDiePie did something, other people start to follow along. People who value his opinion, people who want to ride the trend, this next 13.5% are the early adopters. They're still super influential, helping to set the trends, but tend to be a bit more picky in what they choose to endorse than the innovators. Markiplier and Smosh Games are two great examples from YouTube. They'll accept some of the innovators' ideas, Flappy Bird, Impossible Quiz, Goat Simulator, but not all of them. These top two categories are the ones that set the trends, and their combined social power is what starts spreading the word. This in turn motivates the early majority to join in. If there's enough momentum, you crest that hill, and it's all downhill from there. At that point, to the late majority and the laggards, it seems like everyone is talking about this great Flappy Bird thing. So they download it, and now you have people who've never even heard of PewDiePie, Markiplier, or Smosh raging at their phones trying to get past six pipes just because they heard about it from a friend who heard about it from a friend who heard about it from a friend who saw it on PewDiePie's channel. And that's the key. PewDiePie and Flappy Bird are just easy examples. They're the catalysts that get the ball rolling, but ultimately, it's all a popularity contest. Don't you want to get the games that your friends are playing? Or the ones that you know everyone is talking about right now? We're trained to trust the majority because we don't want to be the one left out of the conversation. If everyone else is doing it, I guess I should too. It's actually an evolutionary instinct, and it provides us the answers to all the questions we've been asking throughout the last three episodes. Why do sequels seem to grow and grow in the numbers? It's because they've already established a significant following, putting it well into the early majority, meaning each game needs less and less energy to crest that early adoption hill. Why can't you predict what's gonna trend next? It's because nobody knows what the pewds will focus on, and then what the rest of the early adopters will choose to pick up and run with. Why did the Virtual Boy fail? There weren't enough early adopters saying that it was cool, setting the trend. Trust me, if neck pain 
vaccines and eye strain were considered to be the fad by influencers like the pudes, the sales story around the Virtual Boy would be much different. And finally, bringing us all the way back around, why has the Wii U been slow to grow? The same reason. There's not enough startup momentum to push it over that early majority hill and create the buzz needed for it to become the next smash hit. And why doesn't that buzz exist? Here's the big reveal for all of you sticking around this long. It's all related to Nintendo being anti-YouTube in its copyright policies. Believe it! They're killing their own momentum by stifling the voices of some of the most influential people in the gaming space right now. YouTube gamers. Video game website traffic right now is trending downward because everyone's moving to YouTube for their news and entertainment, but Nintendo's policies have made YouTube gamers afraid to talk about their games for fear of getting copyright strikes. And that cuts off the first critical 15% of people who set the trends for the rest of the gaming community. You don't want us to talk about the new Smash Brothers? Fine, we'll go play Goat Simulator instead. And is that, perhaps, the big reason why the PS4 with its built-in online sharing ability is crushing the sales of both Xbox One and Wii U? Maybe, but hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. Hey, you should subscribe to this channel. We're pretty awesome around here. Now, with that business out of the way, welcome back to the Super Amazing End Card Tournament, where last time Smite Gods and Goddesses clashed for your clicks. In the end, it came down to two, Neath and Aphrodite, but with 10,000 more votes, it was Aphrodite who took the cheesecake. This time, something a bit different. In honor of Howard Moskowitz, I ask you, which pasta sauce do you prefer? Regular, spicy, or chunky? Click on one to choose, but as we learned today, you probably don't know which you like. Well, at this point you probably do, because they make all these varieties. But who knows, maybe your favorite is something like marinara marshmallow fluff or tomato basil and gummy bears. Anyway, all this food talk has made me hungry, so if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go make some cheese fondue. More like cheese fondue, because it's fun to do. Wow, lame puns today. Oof, so bad.